Well, welcome everyone and good morning. Mine's blown already this morning. <laughs> Terrific. Welcome, I am Reverend Cindy Grimes. I don't think we have any first time visitors today, do we? Anyone here? Oh, we do. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Make sure we get a visitor's packet before you go this morning. So, I'm so happy you all are here. Welcome and happy Sunday. We are talking about living the science of mind here. That is our, that's actually our theme for the year. We teach a philosophy here called the Science of Mind here at the Center for Spiritual Living, and it's been around now for 100 years, and we're celebrating that this year. And so the whole year is really going to be about the science of mind applied to your life, your everyday life, and, and how to really use it. And we're going to apply it in very specifically coming soon. I'm very excited about that. So uh, this morning, we're talking about the law of mind. And I'm just going to go over what we've been talking about a little bit for the past month. And what is it that we actually believe? And I think that video showed it very well. The idea that consciousness, or what looks like that empty space, is really the source and the substance of everything that is of all that is, that everything begins in thought, and that we are part of that consciousness, just as is everything in, in this universe. And again, that, that video, I think, just showed that so beautifully. We are centers of consciousness within that infinite mind. The infinite mind is the great big mind with the capital M, and then and we use it, we use that with our, I call it the small m mind. Right? We are part of that same consciousness. We're using it all the time, whether we realize it or know it or even acknowledge it. We are always creating, always, always creating. And I've talked about this too. If you decide when you get up in the morning, I don't feel like creating anything today. I'm gonna just lay in bed and pull the covers up over my head and not go anywhere and not do anything. Have you created something? Absolutely. You've created a day in bed with covers over your head and I'm not going to do anything. You're still creating, whether you are trying to or not. Kind of a negative attitude. Kind of a negative attitude, yes, yes. So we use the power of that infinite mind to create our experience of life in every moment, whether we realize it or not. Everything is going through the filter of your mind. So what we do here is try to teach you how to use that mind better. Not to tell you what to believe or how to believe, but how to use that incredible power that is already within you for your purposes. And then last week, I talked about this idea of heaven and hell being states of consciousness, not actual places that we go. And I'm gonna delve into that a little more deeply today. I, you know, I felt a little bit bad because in my mind, I kind of ridicule this, this whole thing. I'm, I'm so beyond that idea. And then I felt a little bad about it because I don't want to disrespect anybody's beliefs. And then I read what Ernest Holmes said about it, and I felt better. <laughs> because he had some fun things to say. Um, well, this one was my favorite, I think. When I lost hell, I lost the greatest asset I have because there's nowhere to send the people who disagree with me. <laughs> I, I miss it more than any of my infantile possessions, but I couldn't carry it along into adulthood <laughs> because the place cooled off so long ago. <laughs> and this one a little more serious. We believe in hell because we have so many fears, such unconscious sense of guilt that we seek to release from the emotional tension of that guilt by projecting the thought that we need to be punished for our mistakes. This, no doubt, is the origin of the belief in hell. And then this last one. We either believe there's a God who's good and a devil that's bad, or we can understand that the devil is the personification of the sum total of our human fears, plus an inward sense of justice, which causes us all to feel that evil doing must be punished. So, Interesting, huh? I know I've always believed that. I've always felt that. And it's just so, you know, it's really cool for me to see that outlined in such a really, um, I think, powerful way, a very clear and direct way. So the word hell actually comes from uh, the Saxon verb helan, which means to cover, to conceal, or to hide. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say anything about torment, it doesn't say anything about fire doesn't mean anything about being punished forever. It's to cover, conceal, or to hide. 
And to me, that's saying that, that what we're doing when we're in hell is that we're concealing, we're hiding from our real truth, from who we really are. You know? And then that picture, again, I used that one last week because it's just so absurd. <laughs> but to think that there would be an angel or someone who's supposed to be good and light and love, you know, that would throw someone, anyone, into a fiery pit forever is just like, wow. Wow, crazy, right? How many of us in here are parents? How many of your kids have done something wrong? <laughs> How many of you would throw your kid in a fiery pit for eternity? <laughs> for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, we're we're just human beings, right? We're human beings. We have our flaws and our this and our that. But if God, if God is supposed to be the ultimate, the biggest, the, wouldn't you think that God would have it together a little more than that? Right? That he wouldn't have those, he, she, it wouldn't have those anger management issues and threaten those kind of things. It's just, it's ridiculous. So anyway, there's lots of stuff on, online. I actually saw a video yesterday from Bishop uh, Shelby Spahn that uh, Shanna sent, uh, who is a, a traditional, you know, comes from a traditional um, spiritual path. I think he's Methodist. And he talked about how the idea was created really to, to uh, keep people under control, because people who are afraid are easier to control. So if the church is telling you that, that we are running the show, and you have to come through me, or you have to come through us for your ultimate salvation, that's going to have you walk in a straight line, right? At least that was the idea. But we don't believe that anymore. And there I go, going backwards again. So Ernest Holmes said this too. I don't believe in hell, the devil, damnation, or in any future state of punishment. God does not punish people. There is, however, a cause that, excuse me, there is, however, this cause and effect Thing, right, a law of cause and effect which governs all and will automatically punish impartially and impersonally if we conflict with the fundamental harmony. So the idea there being that we're not punished for our sins, we're not punished by some God out there because we've done something wrong. Our punishment, our, our pain, our suffering comes from the natural consequences of our actions. When we are outside of harmony with the laws of the universe. Again, to bring up the idea of gravity. When you understand how gravity works, you work within those parameters. You can say to yourself, I don't believe in gravity. I don't like gravity. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to jump off this roof. And what's going to happen to you? You're going to go splat. You're going to go splat. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Right? You're still subject to that. That's a natural consequence of not using the law properly, of not respecting it, of not paying attention to what you've been taught. This is the same idea. Right? We're not punished because of things that we do wrong because there is a God out there saying that you deserve damnation. It's because you stepped out of line. You stepped off the roof. You weren't paying attention. Right? You didn't know the rules of the game. And you're subject to the rules whether you are aware of them or, or if you're ignorant to them, right? The law doesn't care. You run a stop sign, the cop doesn't care. If you know the rules, you better know the rules. You're supposed to know the rules. But you're getting a ticket either way. Whether you claim you know or you don't, you're still getting a ticket because you broke the law. And that's what happens with us in, in life, right? That there is cause and effect, and we are subject to that whether we like it or believe it or not. So, wouldn't it help to know what some of those rules are? Anybody? Yeah, that's what we teach here. That's what we teach is, is the rules of, of life, of, of spirituality, of, of the world. And so we can use those rules so we can play within the parameters and make life what it was meant to be for us. So there is cause and effect. So why do we experience hell? Because every, is, is there anyone who's not been through their own hell in some way or another? Anybody here? I don't see any hands going up. We've all had that experience. And why? Why if we know better? Well, because maybe we don't. <laughs> we inherit 
Number one, this is what I talked about last week. We inherit unconscious patterns of thought from the collective unconscious, what Holmes called the race consciousness. Now, if you weren't here last week, what I talked about, the analogy I used was the iceberg. You see the iceberg, it, if you're, you're out on the water and you see an iceberg, you're gonna see the tip. You don't see all that's underneath the water. The tip of that iceberg is like your conscious mind. It's how we talk, it's how we're communicating, it's what you're noticing on a, on a regular basis. Well, beneath that, beneath the surface of that is your subconscious mind, where the things that are being filtered are they're still coming in your mind, but you may not be consciously aware of what's going on. Then you've got your unconscious, which is all the automatic stuff that's just happening. It's like your, your hardwiring, so to speak. And then there's, there's a piece that is called the, the collective unconscious. And this is what you called it, Carl Jung called it the collective unconscious. And it's kind of, it's like, um, uh, how to put it, maybe like the paradigm that we're born into. It's, it's conditioning, it's, it's the repository of all the thought, beliefs, feelings, emotions, everything that humanity has ever thought, has ever felt. It's like it's still out there. You know, you think about that video we saw at the beginning that looks like it's all empty space, but there's so much going on in that, within that space. The thoughts, the energy, the emotion, all of that is still kind of somewhere out there. So Jung's idea was that it is part of the collective unconscious. And as human beings, when we're born, we just come right into that. We come into that setup. We come into that world. And, and not all of it is great. Not all of it is great. In fact, a lot of it is really kind of negative. If you think about it, look at, look at the world and what we're seeing around us right now. There is a lot of negativity, a lot of anger, a lot of, of hurt that's not necessarily even ours. You know, we didn't live it, but we're still experiencing the effects of that. So the next thing is that, so we've got the collective unconscious, which is kind of like what everybody comes into. And then we have our own experiences of life that can be held like Because we're all raised by people who are also imperfect beings, you know, who are humans, who, who probably didn't learn the rules of life, like we're learning today, right? So they made mistakes, and then we develop habits and patterns and beliefs that don't serve us. You know, one of those, I call it, it's like a major virus that is a universal kind of a thing, maybe it goes back to the unconscious, is this idea of we're not good enough. So fill in the blank, you know, I'm not smart enough, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough education, I'm not tall enough, I'm not good looking enough, I'm not, you know, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. We all have these things that happen to us and it starts from when we're very young. You think about your own life and probably I'm gonna guess till about five or six, you can remember just living life to the max Everything was wonderful, everything is possible, and then something happened. Something happened. Can anyone relate to that? Mine is, it's going to sound kind of silly, and I, I may have shared this here before, but uh, I can remember to, it was about age five, I think I was, probably exactly four or five, and there was a little Miss America pageant in the Palisades in New Jersey, and I'm from up north, and I wanted to be in this, this beauty pageant. And I practiced my song, a couple of songs. I had my dress picked out. It was a big deal. You know, two hour drive from where we were in New York to, to go to this pageant. And I was all ready to lay it on and right. I had my, my songs and my little dress and my hair was just right. And I didn't even make the first cut. They didn't want to hear my song. They didn't like my dress. You know, I, this is all the stuff I'm telling myself as a little kid. So I made up for myself, I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. You know, they, didn't want, they didn't want to hear me. They didn't want to see me. I didn't look like the pretty little blonde girls that, that won. And so from that, I carried that for the rest of my, my life. You know, it wasn't until about, I was, I was about 40 years old and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm still like that, that broken little kid that wasn't good enough. And we all carry stuff like that. 
there's a, I, I went to a, a workshop. Are any of you familiar with Landmark Education? You know what Landmark Education is? It's a just phenomenal work they do. And they, they do seminars. They get 200 people sitting in a room, and there's a forum leader who's, who's throwing ideas out to the group. And, and people uh, talk about how it applies to their life. And you start to see yourself in this person, and you see yourself in that one. And it's a great... Um, an experience really of oneness that you have when you go to when you go to landmark, but then it covers a lot of stuff. And this is where that idea came from that we all have that point in life where we feel like we're just not good enough. Then there's another one that happens when you're a teenager where you feel like you just don't belong. Anybody relate to that one? And of course you don't belong because of the reason that you're not good enough and it just keeps snowballing, right? <laughs> and then you there's another Another phase where you, you feel like you're all alone, like you're the only one. You know, so, and you talk about how people, how this relates to people in their in their day to day lives. The guy that led my forum was had been a physician. He was a surgeon, so someone uh, at Sloan Kettering, which is one of the best cancer hospitals in, in the country, a very accomplished individual. His story was from he was a little kid and he stuck a pot on his head. He's like five years old, everything's great. He sticks this pot on his head and he can't get it off. <laughs> and so his mom or somebody said, you're so clumsy, Joey. And so Joey, for the rest of his, his life, until he realized what he was doing, believed that he was clumsy. Now here he is, a surgeon. A surgeon working on people's, you know, bodies, intricate pieces and stuff, and still believing that he's clumsy on some level. Like he's a fraud. Then there was Boney Joni. Boney Joni was, <laughs> she's a model, a gorgeous, gorgeous woman. But in her head, because the kids made fun of her when she was a little girl, she was still Boney Joni. And it was just going to be a matter of time before people found out she wasn't all that. You yeah. know? Everybody is carrying their stuff. So we, we get these unhealthy thought patterns through our upbringing and we carry them into adulthood until we become aware of them. You know, then we can, we can start to let go of that stuff. Why else do we experience hell? Because we can. <laughs> because we can. Because we have free will. Because you have that choice. And sometimes you just want to do things the hard way. Sometimes you want to suffer. Yes, as Gail said, sometimes people want to suffer. What can I say? Perfectly, you know, it, perfectly happy being miserable. People have, yes, being perfectly happy being miserable. Yes, we, we know people like that. I hope it's none of nobody in the room. But sometimes it does serve our purpose. I think there are people who want to believe, as Ernest Holmes said, that there is a hell. Because all those people that you don't like, all those people who disagree with you are going to go there. So, so we keep it around. We keep it around. It serves. Good reason not to go. It's a, <laughs> a good reason not to go. And you know, I think part of it is that we we kind of like the contrast. I think sometimes we like the contrast. It's almost like you can't experience the really, really good, and you can't know how wonderful life is until you've really been in a pit of despair. Right? There's there's nothing like a little grief and mourning and drama and trauma. To have you really appreciate when things go well. Yes? Yes. Can you relate? Right? We do this to ourselves. Now, it's not necessary. That's what I want to teach you all. It's not necessary that we do this. And also, here's Aren't the big thing. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, when I go now, when I go into that hellish place, sometimes I think it's even by choice. I know that I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I go in there for a little while. I take care of business and I come out. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was one of those gratitude practices. A gratitude practice. So, so here's the other thing. The other reason we experience hell is because we're ignorant about, about the truth of who we are. We have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten our power. We have forgotten our ability to create. We have, we have given our responsibility to someone else. We are ignorant to who we are. How many of you have seen Lion King? Remember the movie Lion King? Do you remember that part with where uh, Rafiki and uh, or what's it, Simba? Simba meets Rafiki, and Rafiki takes him into the into the woods, and they find this this pond, this reflecting pond, 
and Mufasa's face comes to, to Simba, right? And he says, my son, you have forgotten who you are. You're, and Simba's going through a tough time. Simba's in his dark night of the soul, and his father says, you've forgotten who you are. You're my son. You know, you're royalty. You are much, much better than this. Step up and be who you came here to be. Right? And that's the message for all of us. We have all, in some way or another, forgotten who we are, our great power, and what we came here to be. And when you're in that hellish place, it's easy to forget. It's real easy to forget. And that's, to me, one of the beautiful things about spiritual community, is that when you're in, in your pit of despair, when you're going through your dark night, that there are people around you who can say, I know who you are. I know what you're about. I know that you're better than this. And I'm going to hold you in that light. And I'm going to see in you what you can't see for yourself. And eventually you will see that. That's the hope anyway. I know that's what was done for me. I had a, a wonderful friend that I would sit and I'd cry. I, don't, I can't even tell you how many, how many days, how many hours I would cry about my, my misery when I was going through my dark night. And she would say, I wish you could see what I see in you. I wish you could see it. And I didn't know what she was talking about. But I would hold on to that hope that maybe one day, maybe I will see it. If she sees something, maybe there's something there. She's good. She's a good person. I know that she's got good discernment. She must be seeing something that means there's something there. And I would hold on to that. Right? So be part of spiritual community so, so people can uplift you and help you remember who you are. That's part of why we come together in this place. So if hell, then, is a state of consciousness, so is heaven. And what is that? What is that heavenly place? This is what, and this is paraphrased from what Ernest said. The kingdom of heaven is a thing to be devoutly experienced. It is the pearl of great price for which a man or woman would sell all they have to possess it. And yet, it is the only thing we have even before we ask for it. It is the only thing we possess that we can't lose. It is the only thing that is eternal for it is God incarnated in every soul. Heaven is a state of inner awareness that comes softly and gently to the soul who recognizes its presence. Heaven is here and now, and we can experience that just as easily as we can experience hell. You know, I experience heaven in, in, in so many ways, and I think we're conditioned somehow in society to think that a spiritual experience needs to, needs to be something like a burning bush, you know, something amazing, some big signs and wonders, and it really isn't that at all, although it can be, it can be. But for me, heaven is, is those moments of, of awe, it's the, and it's moments of just perfection when you feel like you're just in the right place at the right time, doing what you came here to do, you're in that flow of life, can anyone live it? You know, moments of, for me, being out in nature, you see something beautiful, watch a, watch a beautiful sunset or a sunrise, or holding my grandbabies, that's my newest, you know, wonderful thing. That's, that's heaven for me, is holding those babies. Again, they're so close to source. You know, there, there are moments here, here where I feel heaven. You know, where I know, and I, and I look in somebody's eyes and I know that I've connected. And I feel that, and I know you feel it too. And that's a heaven moment. You know, for me, is, is, is seeing God reflected back at me and the people in the room. You know, that's heaven. So, so what is it for you? What is it for you? Think about that. Maybe it's laying with your, with your honey snuggled up in bed and just feeling like there's no place else I'd rather be. Right? Don't I? Someone told, I ran into someone yesterday, uh, Monique, actually, at, the, at uh, Target. And she said she was telling somebody about how I talk and then I get these diamonds in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I do it every week, just about. Um, 
So I'm, I'm glad that she called it diamonds and not something else. It's just holy water, whatever. Uh, yes, heaven, heaven, what is that? And it, and it moves me. It moves me. So think about those moments when you feel moved, when something moves you, a piece of beautiful music or a piece of art or just fill in the blank, you know, whatever it is that brings you that sense of, of joy and fulfillment, that's what you need to be doing more of, you know? Put yourself in a position where you, you're experiencing that, a little bit of that every day, whatever that is for you, and it's different for everyone. So, so then the question becomes, how can we experience heaven more often? As a man thinketh, how many of you have heard of this book? It's not even a book, really. It's just a little pamphlet. It's a, it's just amazing, and it actually is available online. If you are interested, go online. It's a PDF. You can download it for free because it's in the public domain. It's been around that long. This is what James Allen says: Man is made or unmade by himself. In the armory of thought, he forges the weapons by which he also destroys himself. He also fashions the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, man ascends the divine perfection. By the abuse and wrong application of thought, he descends below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is their mask maker and their master. What he's saying here is it's the same power. It's the same principle. It is the same law that we are using to create hell in our lives and heaven. It's all how we choose to use it, and it is all about where we are focusing our attention. The law of mind. That's what Ernest Holmes called it, the law of mind. We can change our thinking and cause the very law that limited us to bring us freedom. Now, by show of hands, how many of you here today have something that you could complain about? Raise your hand. Right? Every hand should be up, I would think, right? We all have something. Okay, now raise your hand if you have something that you can be grateful for. We all have that as well. Isn't that interesting? We have both. Now, where is it that we are choosing to put our attention? Because that is what's going to put you in heaven or in hell. So you can, and it's not to say you don't acknowledge the difficulty or the problems or the issues, because that's how you take responsibility and, and redirect. But don't wallow in it. Right? Don't stay in that place, because that is going to bring you more of the same. We are surrounded by an infinite, subconscious, impersonal, neutral, plastic, and ever-present thinking stuff. That's why I use the piece of clay. This stuff is the stuff from which all things come and which permeates and penetrates all things. By impressing our thought upon this substance, we can cause it to produce for us that which we think. So there is... There is a substance. There is something in this universe. We can't see it. We can't see it. It's, in, it's invisible, and that's why people don't acknowledge it. But we can see the effects of it. You can't see the wind. You can't see microwaves. You can't see a lot of things, but we know they exist because we use them. We can harness the power behind them. So there is a thinking stuff that we are thinking into all of the time. What you're thinking, what you're putting into that stuff is going to determine what is created for you, just like a piece of clay. The clay doesn't care what you make out of it. Right? You can make a, a vase, you can make a plate, you can make a statue, you can make anything you want out of that clay, and the clay doesn't care. How about that? It's the same thing with this thinking stuff, with this thinking substance that we are thinking into. It doesn't care what you put into it. It doesn't care if you're straight. It doesn't care if you're gay. It doesn't care if you have money. It doesn't care if you're poor. It doesn't care if you're a kid. It doesn't care if you're an adult. 
It doesn't matter. We're using it all the time. This is, this is the spiritual path, and this is part of what we're here to practice, spiritual practice. And if you want to know what, you're, what you've been molding, what you've been fashioning with that clay, look at your life. Look at your life, and that will tell you where your attention has been and what you've been doing with this incredible faculty of your imagination and thought. It is plastic. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care what things you've done in the past. It does, none of that matters. It's what you want to create. What are you consciously putting out into this universe, and what do you want to come back to you? Does that make sense for everyone? Okay, and then the Bible said it like this. The Bible says it this way. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. This is our challenge. And it's a, it's a great challenge in, in this day and age. I know every time I get on my computer, the time I check my email, I get the news for the day. I go on Facebook, just, just seeing what the kids are doing, I get the news of the day. And, and it, it can bring me down quickly. You know, I go in those, in those little spirals and then I have to catch myself. Where am I putting my attention? Yes, those things are happening. And no, I don't want to ignore it, but that's not where I'm gonna put my focus. That's not where I'm gonna put my attention, my energy. If, if I put my attention in any realm in that negativity, it's going to be to say, what can I do to make it better? How can I make this situation better? You know, it's like the serenity prayer, right? It's knowing, it's, tell me the serenity prayer. God, 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 God to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. That's right. Okay. So that's we, where we get stuck. That's where we get stuck. The wisdom to know the difference. I'm going to ask you to say it again nice and loud in case people hear it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There you go. Yes. So knowing the things that you can change, having the wisdom, what can I change, and what is somebody else's to do? That will keep you out of hell, too. It's just tending to what is yours and where you can have an influence. So if I feel myself spinning off into the politics and the this and the that, I have to at some point say, you know, what is within my realm that I have influence over? Where can I change things? Where can I make things better? And that is where I focus my attention and my energy. How can I make things better? Right? To focus on, Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, focus on that and bring that to the forefront because that's what I want in my life. That's the experience I want to have. And my experience of life, just like your experience, begins in here. It begins within you. My life begins within me. Right? Your life begins within you. So what you want to see out there is what you need to bring to the game. Okay? That is the law of mind in action. <laughs>